Um, welcome to the monthly Lean Enterprise Division webinar through AFQ. I'm Ellen Ermer, and I'm your host today. I am the chair of the LED webinars. We hold these webinars once a month. They're free to our members, and they are also recorded and put on the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division YouTube channel, so you have the opportunity to go back and listen to them. Everyone will be on mute, but you're free to post questions as you think of them. Howard has reserved about 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions, and we may try to answer some questions as we go through this webinar also, as he has some polls that he'll be asking. You will receive a certificate of attendance 24 hours after the webinar for your RU. And it's going to look like this. This is how you access it. So you will see this email and you will see a certificate coming to you. In addition, just a little bit of a, um, a view of what it should look like on your screen currently so that you're able to ask questions. You can see where the question bank is. And if you click that drop down button, you can put questions in there. Uh, once we have, once we provide polls, it'll be obvious how to answer those. And as a reminder, our next webinar will be Wednesday, July 8th. And this will also be at noon central time. And the topic will be making it happen with lean management and the robotics process automation. And Gerald Taylor will be our speaker. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Howard Zwick, Principal Consultant for Z Operation Solutions. He's held several leadership roles in manufacturing, QA, production planning, um, and ERP system in implementation, integration factories throughout USA, uh, Asia, and Europe. And he works with clients to improve their safety culture beyond compliance he utilizes quality and lean principles to help safety quality and productivity with that i am going to hand over the presentation to howard all right thank you ellen and uh i gotta start sharing my screen when ellen gives me the rights to Um, so, okay, sorry, we're going to get to share my screen. Perfect. Okay, um, so I believe everyone can see that now. Um, so the, the topic today is safety lean, ultimately, can we make it leaner and safer? And and I put the tagline on this front slide to, to really try and remind myself, but also remind everyone what the goal is, is to really look at linkages of how uh, some of the lean practitioners in the in the group and how you can apply some of the same principles of lean to manufacturing, uh, lean to safety. Uh, and so how do you integrate safety into your lean practices, into your general practices? And uh, you know, as Ellen said, we'll talk for about 50 minutes and with some questions. I do encourage you to please ask questions along the way because we will try and answer at least some of them uh, during different parts of it that may be more relevant to the, the topic and the timing in the presentation. So my background, as Ellen talked about, is uh, 25 plus 30 years of, of manufacturing environments, um, starting in operation supervision, going into quality uh, full time, and eventually uh, working my way into employee health and safety, back into quality, into a lot more manufacturing operations. And uh, the last three years or so, I've been a consultant and working with companies on operational improvements uh, in a lot of different areas. And one of them being uh, in employee health and safety, where a lot of my practice is. And I try and integrate the quality background, the operations background to help the employee safety. So starting off on something that hopefully you know, is relevant to today is you know, many of you, if you're going into work these days or if you're going into public spaces, are getting your temperature checked as you walk in the door. It's become a routine task. And this particular picture here is one from a local hospital in the Philadelphia area where I live. Uh, and this hospital on their website or some magazine posting, I forgot what it was, 
you know, posted this picture and telling us ultimately how safe they were making it for everybody by taking people's temperatures as they walked into their hospital. And it got me thinking and saying, okay, they have a you know a few lean principles in play in a sense. Um, you know, they have different spots for people to stand on. They have different lanes. So, but in, in the end, you still have an employee sitting there physically having to expose themselves to take a temperature. And I said, I've been traveling to airports around the world, um, specifically in Asia, for many years as part of my jobs and work. And I know that I, for 10 years or more ago, when the SARS epidemic in, went into China, Hong Kong, other places in Asia, Singapore, and every time you walked in, you got funneled into a area where they had one person taking multiple temperatures and with a scanner and saying, okay, this hospital up in the top is thinking they're really helping themselves, yet there's easily available technology that could, as you say in the bottom picture, could easily pick out an employee or a person or a community person that has an elevated temperature. Um, and then there's even you know, simple ones that are, are no human interaction here and the, uh, this, you know, using a smartphone essentially with a little camera to attachment and a software program to do it on a individual basis. So you know, the question is, you know, even in this type of scenario of today's environment, can we make it leaner and safer on something as simple as taking a temperature? Do we need the human interaction or can we use our equipment and our processes to make it even leaner and safer? A uh, little on um, my background, this uh, dilemma that I had when I started my uh, world of working in manufacturing, uh, for those of you, uh, well, uh, the dilemma that we had, and I was employee number two of this company, and the dilemma we were presented was 052 plus 216 plus zero plus six is equal to either a car, and this happens to be the 1980, the time 1988 Dodge Spirit or Plymouth Acclaim, or $1,000. And so I'm going to add a little context to it. But this is a dilemma that I was faced on day one of my first job out of college as an engineer, graduating engineer, working in this place. And what it was was that we actually had 52 seconds plus 216. So the company I was working for was Monroe Auto Equipment and Chrysler in the follow-on to the K car that had saved the Chrysler name, uh, had retooled a factory in Delaware, and they retooled it. And as part of that, they had an agreement with the UAW to outsource the assembly of strut modules and the assembly of seats. And I got hired by Monroe Auto Equipment, who had won the, the job to assemble the strut modules. And the dilemma was we had Every 52 seconds, a car passed the line, passed a point on the line on the assembly line, and was sequenced into place. And once it got sequenced, it didn't change that sequence for the rest of the assembly process. So it came out of the body shop, it passed the point, and they broadcast to us a left and a right strut module, uh, which is a strut plus the springs plus all the assemblies, and that was broadcast to us. And we had to then deliver it 216 minutes later. It was going to be passing a spot on the line where that part was being assembled. So we had three hours and 36 minutes to take a order for a left and a right and have it sitting at the line with the in the hands of the assembler to put onto that part of the, the piece of the, the car. We had zero finished goods and we had a combination of 18 different parts, uh, part numbers that we could have ordered. And we had to deliver them six miles away, just in time in sequence. And that six miles could take anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes, depending on the traffic. And the first one off of the truck needed to go to the line first, which meant that we actually had to, the first one ordered had to be the last one loaded on the truck. And the dilemma was that we had to do all that because at the end of that 260 minutes, they had a car coming off the line. And if they didn't, we had a fine of $1,000 a minute. So we didn't want to waste any time. We didn't want to miss any opportunities. We couldn't afford to be late uh, from a customer satisfaction or a dollar standpoint. And what I didn't realize at the time was how we did things at the time and what we did to make it lean, make it effective, make it efficient, make it redundant where we needed redundancy. And so it was the beginning of my lean dilemma, even though I had no idea what the word lean meant.
So uh, we're going to start with a, a poll here and a question for all of you. And Ellen, if you can release the first poll of um, who owns safety at your company. And so if you can all uh, vote now, uh, so the options, management, safety department. Oh, no, Ellen, different poll. Wrong one. That's the next one. You release the other poll. Yep, sorry, that's it. So who owns safety? Well, I'm sorry. Ellen, if, there you go. So who owns safety at your company? And um, the poll is open and if you can uh, start voting here and picking that and, and really the question becomes, you know, in your operation, your company, or if you work with different companies, uh, you can pick one and, and make a guess and we'll let Ellen uh, close it up in a second. But again, please ask questions uh, along the way if you have different thoughts of, of things or questions. So with that, you know, we talk about the who owns safety and my hope is that uh, I'll give you the, the answer that I'm hoping we'll see. And Ellen, if we've got enough answers, uh, go ahead and close it and share the results, please. All right, so um, it's a great result so that, in this case, everybody, 82% uh, of you picked all employees, which is what I hope would be the answer, um, because we want to have, and we really want to encourage all employees to feel like they have an ownership stake in safety. And with that, uh, you know, we want that to be there. I, I saw there was management, some safety department people. You know, management and everybody certainly owns safety and is responsible for safety. But ultimately, we want all employees to feel their ownership to safety. And so, uh, hopefully, that's that's a great sign for for your companies that that a good portion of you have that. And Ellen, if you could release the next poll, the does your company use lean practices to improve safety? All right, so if everyone can vote again, um, whether you know this is something a new com concept for you or is something that where you already are applying lean practices. And uh, I know that I've worked with companies where the answer is certainly never. Uh, I've worked with companies where the answer is they really don't may not realize it, but they occasionally actually do. Uh, and rarely do I see ones where it's well developed and part of the culture, but uh, some of you with especially those that have had the all employees might have that as a situation. Uh, so Ellen, if you wanna close that poll and share it. All right, so there's a, a mixture here, which doesn't surprise me of, um, you know, occasionally to some well-developed or rarely every, all across the board and, and that's fine. And really what we, um, you know, in an ideal world, you know, some of you in the well-developed, that's great. Uh, but those of you that, uh, you know, hopefully you get some ideas out of this webinar today and can start working towards integrating some of these lean principles that most, many of you probably are uh, well-versed in into the world of safety. So thank you for answering those polls and uh, we'll continue on this. So the... When I look at safety, um, and you know, maybe not surprising, I look at safety as, as sort of a circle with quality. Um, I include the word food safety because several of the companies I work with are in the food safety world. Um, so, or you know, supplying food or food products to or products to food companies. Um, and efficiency, I, I look at them as one big circle of things. And that is that they sort of feed on each other. They're similar with each other. And I rarely see one where someone is excellent at one without being excellent or at least very good at all. And I rarely see someone, one where someone is poor at one and they're really good at the others. Um, so oftentimes they go together because they all follow similar practices, similar disciplines and a lot of focus. And when we think about all this stuff, I think about it and say, you know, yeah, employees, you know, we worry about employee safety. We look at our customers and the quality of the products. And our investors certainly appreciate the efficiency and effectiveness of our, our overall outcomes. Um, and they really do tie together in how you think about things and how you talk about the discipline of the employees, the discipline of the management, the focus of the management. Um, they all go together. And, and I, I like this quote here, safety versus productivity. If either wins, both lose. 
Um, so if you think about it that way, we're not trying to optimize just safety. We're not trying to optimize just productivity or just quality. We're trying to optimize the overall effectiveness of our company and they all go together. We expect that we need to protect our employees, we need to protect our customers, we need to satisfy our investors in order to all be an effective and efficient uh, and good operation. So uh, going back to a, a part of my uh, journey of life, one of the uh, other jobs I had, we were trying to implement some major quality improvements in the factory that I was in. And it happened to be a UAW factory. Um, and the, the comments from the employees, a couple employees really, but one that really stuck out to me was, you only care about quality in slow season. You only care about output in busy season. And the answer to that was, they were right. Effectively, they were right if you look back historically. Um, and historically, they were, you know, the company really focused on output when busy season came around and they really focused on quality or we said they focused on quality when you can afford to focus on quality. And we were trying to make a fundamental change as a management team in trying to say to our employees, we care about quality all the time. And they said, we don't believe you, you have to prove it to us. And it took years of really emphasizing it and being consistent in this to really prove it to people. And I can substitute the word quality for safety in a lot of these situations. And in this case, we did care about safety all the time, but they were right probably too, is that there were probably things that slipped from a safety standpoint. And I was relatively new in the company when this happened and this, you know, this fundamental change happened. Um, but that fundamental change and that fundamental caring and that fundamental uh, change made a huge difference in the company performance lowering our warranty rates and everything else because we really proved that and had to prove to our employees that we cared about quality all the time. So in my journey, uh, um, as I said, I went from a quality to a safety. And, and while it was well before 2015 and well before these particular books I'm showing on the screen were published, but I was you know, well-versed at the time in ISO 9001. And my boss said, how will you want to learn about safety? And um, so I went to a class and started learning about all the OSHA regulations. And he came back and said, well, what did you learn? And I said, well, I learned a new rule book, but I still want to do business the same way, which is good processes, good practices. And when I say I learned a new rule book, um, to give you a perspective, you know, ISO 9001 is roughly a 30 page document. The OSHA manual that I, uh, even I just got some refresher training on something, the OSHA training manual right now that I got is 784 pages. Uh, the one I have from way back when is you know, probably about the same thickness, just a little different sizes. So huge amount of, of pages. And then another factor is the ISO 9001 has roughly 131 shalls. So you shall do this. The OSHA standard, uh, based on a, a search I did for the word shall, had over 16,000 shalls. So when we talk about the rules have changed uh, from quality to safety, uh, I've been through a lot of training. I will never learn all 16,000 shalls. Uh, but in general terms, there's a lot of rules to know, a lot of things to follow. And not surprisingly, when we're talking about employee safety, employees' lives that are affected. So. Um, there's a lot of different things when you talk about compliance in the world of OSHA and EPA has another thousands of jobs. And uh, by the way, I'll put a disclaimer on this. Don't quote me on this and, and publish it somewhere. I mean, these are things I, I found on the internet or did a search myself, but roughly speaking, you get the picture that there's a whole lot of things in the safety manuals that you gotta learn and deal with from an employee and uh, protection standpoint. So why do we care about this? Well. You know, when employees are injured, we talk about a direct cost and an indirect cost of injuries. Ultimately, we're trying to have safe employees that are satisfied workers. And when we have injuries, um, not only are we essentially burning money, you know, we're burning money from the standpoint of a direct cost of the workers' comp costs. So the workers' compensation costs or the cost of the medical care is typically, even if you have insurance, it's really fundamentally passed on to you as an employer. They're, 
you know, the, the rates that you're paying are directly related to your injury history and your, your mod rates and things like that. And so the more injuries you have, the more costs you have in the long run, whether it's direct or, or, you know, or waiting for a little period of time later, you as an employer essentially are paying for that in the workers' compensation costs. But it's really, it's oftentimes the indirect costs, the lost time, the fact that you have employees that aren't happy. Uh, the more injuries you have, the more people that see other people getting injured, I guarantee you your employee satisfaction is dropping. Um, I guarantee you, you know, that there are a number of employees who resent, oh, how come this person's working on light duty and I have to work so hard? I'm working overtime in order to make up for their, their injuries. Uh, so, or you have to hire replacement workers, which means you as a company have to train them. And so ultimately as a company, you're losing productivity, you're losing your employee satisfaction. And in some cases, because of that lack of productivity, you might be affecting your customer satisfaction as well. Uh, and that you might have late orders because you don't have enough employees to satisfy it. So the cost of injuries, uh, you know, some of them are minimal, but some of them can be very extreme in both the direct costs of uh, a back injury or uh, the, the indirect costs, not to mention the human cost and the human toll on our employees who personally now have to deal with a back injury or worse um, and are sitting home or their families are, are affected. So when thinking through uh, safety in, in these terms here, I, I want you to think and go through, you know, what is lean? It's a, a proven methodology to save time, money, improve customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction. So if you fill in the blank with this, um, you know, can you fill in the blank with lean is a journey, you, you can always get better, or safety is a journey, you can always get better, uh, or both. And, and as you go through it, whether it's eliminating waste or getting employees involved, uh, or being ultimately being, I'm too busy, I can't find time to implement lean improvements or safety improvements, you hear all of these things. Uh, and the, the point is that you know, ultimately we're trying to make changes, we're trying to make improvements, we're trying to improve our employee satisfaction, our customer satisfaction, our, our overall performance, and lean is a tool we use to do that, but safety applies to the same things. Um, and ultimately we want to do make changes to have good results and work together as that. Uh, so think about it and, and filling out when you think about your lean journeys, how does that apply to the same way to safety journeys? So some of the similarities I look at between safety, quality, lean uh, include you know, ultimately, as I said earlier, same, same business processes apply to safety as apply to quality. Uh, you want to have good business processes that effectively uh, tell people how to do the work the best way you can. You want to train people to do it effectively, uh, eliminating those non-value added steps. Uh, extra steps, maybe you know, in the lean world, we want to take them out because of uh, making it more effective. Well, oftentimes, if we take out those extra steps, we also take out extra touches, extra opportunities for people to do things in a way that they might get hurt. Um, so if we can reduce that waste, if we can do it right the first time, you know, rework is one of those things that we certainly don't like in a lean world. Uh, but when you think about it from a safety world, oftentimes when people do rework, they're doing non-standard work. And they may have to take, do something special to take something apart or to, you know, to remove the products, put them back away. And when you start doing non-standard work, you end up often having people using non-standard tools, non-standard processes. And in the safety world, that can sometimes lead to a injury that is uh, different because you we weren't necessarily protecting against it the same way. So the more we can train, the more we can document our work, the more we can make it effective and without the non-value added steps, uh, the better. Ergonomics is a huge one. Um, you know, in a lean world, we might do a 5S or 6S from workstation layout to try and make it more effective so people can grab the things in front of them as opposed to above them or, or out to the sides. And the same thing applies to ergonomics. Um, if we can have people working in the zone that's right in front of them, it oftentimes is both leaner as well as uh, more ergonomically effective uh, to be so it's safer and then the world of continuous improvement. So all of these things are really lean principles and safety principles or quality principles together. So ultimately make it easier, faster, more effective, less costly, and safer. 
and uh, we're going to cover more about the some of those techniques and tools. When I look at safety, uh, this is a, a slide I use a lot in safety, is trying to move beyond compliance. We talk about compliance. I showed you that 784-page OSHA manual. Um, that's management's role is certainly to have a compliant workplace because that's the law. We have to do that. Management's role, you know, responsibility is to create safe conditions. But we expect all employees to do safe acts. Now, all employees should also be part of having the safe conditions and pointing out when they're unsafe. All employees should be involved in making sure we're compliant um, because we count on that. But fundamentally, we count on all employees to think about on a regular basis, the safe acts. So we should have trained them as a management team in how to do things and employees are expected to do things safely. Uh, this is an accident pyramid, which some of you may have seen or may not have seen, uh, but think about it from a continuous improvement standpoint. We, from the top of it, you have for every major injury, a death or serious amputation or something like that, you typically have about 30 minor injuries. And for many companies, most companies, I would say, they only do investigations, accident investigations, when there's somebody is injured. They, many companies or most companies don't do accidents investigations for what we call near misses, or I like to actually call near hits. Um, something almost hit somebody or somebody almost got hit. And uh, so certainly more progressive companies and, and involved companies are doing investigations and reporting near misses or near hits. And then you talk about the unsafe conditions. So for that, you then often have thousands of thousands, you know, 3,000 or so unsafe conditions. And the accident pyramid traditional one shows 30,000 unsafe acts or behaviors. And I'll challenge uh, most of you to think about it in terms of probably not 30,000, probably like maybe 3 million or 30 million in some cases, because I work with some factories that are making millions of products a day, a year or so, maybe not a day, millions of products a, a year. Um, and so if you're making millions of products a year, think about how many times someone has to pick something up and move it um, or whatever that might be. And so every time someone picks something up and moves something, that's an opportunity for an unsafe safe actor behavior. Uh, so your company may have millions and millions of unsafe acts or behaviors as potentials. They may not happen on a daily basis. Hopefully they don't, but they're potentially there. And so we want to really drive it and be proactive in how do you do that. Um, so again, some of the same thoughts on continuous improvement and how to drive the root cause corrective actions and really preventive actions into safety. Uh, Another area of commonality I look at here is this hierarchy of controls. And with that, we talk about uh, elimination as being the most effective. And I think about, you know, we go back to our lean principles again. Elimination is one of those things of if we can eliminate a step, uh, we can often make it more lean. Well, in the safety world, if we can eliminate a process, uh, sometimes we've made it also safer. Not always, but sometimes we do. Uh, so if you can eliminate a hazard in the case of a safety situation, great. We, you know, we can physically remove the hazard. Maybe we can't eliminate it, but maybe we can substitute it. Maybe we, maybe we can use less of a chemical. Maybe we can use a different chemical that's less hazardous. So in this case, you might also be getting greener in some cases in addition to safer. Um, engineering controls, for instance, like a light curtain is an engineering control where we isolate people from the hazard or machine guards. And the same thing of, you know, by doing that, we often make it safer. Um, and some of those same type of controls can sometimes automate things and make it leaner. And administrative controls are things like uh, work procedures. So if we have procedures and standard processes, again, we've made it, uh, we're, it's a way of making it safer, but also sometimes more effective and more lean. So these things go together and we wanted to try and push us to the top of this pyramid and eliminate or substitute wherever we can. Uh, going into the, the eight ways to lean, um, you know, the, the traditional eight ways to lean of transportation, inventory, motion, people waiting. You look at this list and you say, well, what do some of them have to do with safety? Well, think about it from a transportation standpoint. I'm going to cover transportation in a minute, but if you have a forklift walking, going across your factory, um, every time that forklift goes across an aisle, moving product from one place to another, 
you have a potential of employees and forklifts interacting. So it's just one example of moving product is a way of, of having an opportunity for a piece of equipment to get in there. Moving product also physic person, if you're moving it by hand, uh, every time you lift up something and move it, you're now taking opportunities for people to have to lift, pro lift boxes, twist with boxes, uh, raise your hands up and put them on top of a stack. So all that type of transportation, moving things uh, are all opportunities. Inventory, you said, what does inventory have to do with safety? Well, too much inventory um, happens all the time in a lot of fact, certainly some of the factories I've worked with. And I, I go through them and they say, well, we have no room to, to move around. You know, we have things next to every piece of equipment. We have things in the next to the aisles. We don't have space to, to safely walk through. Um, and so again, having too much inventory or having inventory in the wrong places, too close to the machines or too close to walkways are opportunities that uh, might be both less lean as well as less safe. Uh, so when you think through these things, uh, you know, even that, so the over-processing, over-production going along with that extra inventory, the, the defects I talked about earlier of when you have defects and you have rework, those are opportunities for people to have to do things twice or have to do things in a way that's non-traditional. Uh, so with all of these things, you can take a, a thought through and, and think it and say, these things apply to, to a lean principle, certainly, but if you can apply these same questions and the same thoughts to your, your when you look at it from a safety standpoint, think about how we can take extra motions out of the process. Do we need the people to really twist or lift? Can we do something instead and make it more safe? Um, so all of those things can help us make it and, and make it more safe. So the more value by taking out and, and reducing these lean wastes can also make it safer at the same time. Uh, another area we talk about is integrating safety into the process. And we talked, uh, uh, in some cases, I already talked about that in the sense of procedures, work instructions, training. We don't need a safety manual. Just like I would say, you don't need a quality manual. We need a business processes manual. We need processes that cover different things. And you don't need to have safety as a separate standalone um, document on many of your work procedures, your job, you know, your production uh, standard works. You can should integrate, I would advocate integrating safety directly into your work state, your work processes. Tell people where they, just like you talk about process controls from a, a quality standpoint, we can talk about the process safety, the hazards that are involved, and what the controls are on those hazards. And, and a job hazard analysis is just an example of, that I have here in the bottom, of uh, a way of looking at different work tasks, looking at the hazards involved, and then looking at the controls involved. And if you look at the example I've got here, um, if you can read through it enough, but you can see that I've got a couple pictures in there. And fundamentally though, in a way, we're, we've got a procedure written under the control section that also includes the safety stuff. So you can use something like a job hazard analysis as a training tool to both cover or integrate, you know, use the same principles where you want to look like a job hazard analysis or some, something else, but you can integrate those safety steps and the safety controls into your normal practices. Uh, and same thing with training, and so using these things together. Uh, your audits, you, know, you don't. We talk about doing safety audits a lot of times with the safety committee, or your supervisors might be doing, a, for instance, a regular gamble walk on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Um, how do you integrate safety into those audits? So if your supervisors are already going around doing a audit of the process, well, they should be looking at safety as part of that. Um, new equipment is a huge opportunity to look at safety. So when you have changes, um, I can't tell you how many times I see companies where they put in a new piece of equipment and the new piece of equipment, they both missed an opportunity to make it safer than the old piece of equipment. And in some cases, they brought in something that is actually created some new hazards that no one thought through and could have avoided in many cases and so you brought in this new equipment, that's new shiny piece of equipment to make it more efficient, more effective, more capacity, whatever the reasons are, more capability. Um, but did you take advantage of that opportunity to also make it safer? 
Um, and so do your equipment reviews, do your chemical reviews. And when you're doing those things, think about that pyramid I talked about earlier of the hierarchy of controls. Can we eliminate things? Can we make it substitute? Can we make it safer by putting engineering controls in? Um, and have we created any new hazards that we need to worry about? So your traditional spaghetti diagram, uh, an example here of you know just moving product around with a, a warehouse, a QC, or whatever. So it's a, a standard tool of a lot of lean. And think about it now from the standard tool of safety, lean safety at the same time, is that if you have product moving across like from B to E, like I show with a forklift, um, think about how many potential people it's walk, it has to go across when you move something across uh, in aisles like that. And so the more we can make it leaner and more effective in uh, rearranging things, sometimes we can also be making it safer by having less interactions between people and moving products. Um, I, I would imagine that many of you have done 5S or even 6S, and nowadays I guess people do sometimes a 7S, uh, but you know, I certainly would advocate for 6S to be a standard part of things. And when you're doing your 6S, your cleanups, your organizations, your focus on things, uh, include safety. Uh, and I look at the you know, traditional, the, the, the workstation layout here of, um, you know, might be beautiful in design from an ergonomic stand or from a, uh, a sort and a set in order. Uh, but at the same time, as I said earlier, some of those same tools that are showing on this particular workstation are also great safety improvements from an ergonomic standpoint. They might be putting products close to where the operator is, uh, an adjustable keyboard, whatever that is, and a monitor that might be at the right height for them. So those types of things can be both a ergonomic and a success uh, improvement and and by a safety improvement at the same time. Uh, things like even the office, you know, having things in the office that are sorted and clutter free um, might make it less of a fire hazard in that office. You know, if you look in the, the desk on the left, they have junk underneath, they have things under there and they might, who knows what electrical wires and other things they might have in addition to that. Um, and so even from a fire standpoint, you've made it safer by getting less clutter, less paper, less uh, more organized in the right ways. So all these things go together. Um, another tool that we would like to use and I think are effective for both quality, safety, and, and other operations is the communication. Um, if your company or if your factory, if your whatever is having a daily safety, daily meeting, uh, whether it's a, whether they call it a toolbox talk or um, I was on a, doing a webinar last night and someone said, you know, Agile, if you're doing software development, they have Agile team meetings for 15 minutes every day. Um, so when you're doing those types of meetings, if you're already having the meetings, include safety as part of that. And that safety can be a safety moment and talks in terms of, okay, we were, everybody was safe yesterday. Uh, it can be safety opportunities of things that, oh, we observed different things uh, or we heard of a sister company, a sister factory that had a problem. Um, so talk about it, or it could be training. Um, so use those opportunities, talk about safety, talk about, remind people where emergency exits are, what the routes are. Don't just assume that what people heard at a safety orientation, whether it was three weeks ago or three years ago, uh, that people remember these things. So use these opportunities to, to push safety as well as your other opportunity, your other uh, discussions. Um, you know, it's just like in quality, show the metrics, show the data, um, share the information with everybody in ways that make sense and uh, that are meaningful for people. And, and talk about those corrective actions and near misses, really be actively involved in trying to get down to root cause, trying to get down to preventive actions and implement those things. So these are just some of the examples of whether it's metrics and results and, and minutes, to how to share and communicate in ways and safety the same way that you probably are sharing some of the, the lean improvements or the, the operational improvements that you're making. Um, so uh, here's a quiz, a, another survey. Um, Ellen, if you can release this survey. The, what are your safety metrics? Now, unfortunately, GoToWebinar only allows us to have five options. Um, so 
if you have uh, one of the five options that I have on the survey when it gets released by Ellen, um, please answer them. But if not, uh, I'd love to hear what some of your what your uh, metrics are if they're not on the list. So please chat some of them to us right now, um, and we I can maybe include a few of them. But I'd like to hear it anyway because I'd like to understand what safety metrics companies are using. Uh, I would imagine that many of them in manufacturing, uh, most common is going to be the OSHA injury rate. And by the way, you can you can vote for more than one. Pick all that apply. Uh, so please pick all that apply. And um, but you know, Howard, uh, certainly yes. Excuse me. Right, since Alan. it was released on accident initially, people answered and it's closed. So this is what uh, we got when we um, answered. Um, we're unable okay. to. Open right. it back there's up again. No, there's no way of clearing it and opening it back up. Okay. No. All right. So okay. So um, uh, if anyone wants to chat some of them to me anyway, I'd love to to see what they are. If you can chat some of your uh, metrics, I would imagine I that many of you. Are... Go ahead. Sure. Oh, Thanks. Oh, sorry. Go no. Go ahead, please. Behavior, so, let me know. Yeah. Behavior-based safety. Number of near misses. Safe observations. OSHA recordable. Days without injuries, again, number of near misses, same thing, number of near misses. Um, OSHA recordables, EE safety suggestions, weekly um, HAZ audits. That seems to be a bit. Okay. Uh, again, safe right. observation, say that. So, so I'm glad to hear um, some of that. Okay, so go ahead. You can go ahead and close the sharing then. Um, so thank you for those that chatted some of your answers and, and, you know, I look at, um, those safety metrics we talked about and I, you know, look at them as lagging and leading and the OSHA injury rate or number of injuries or something that, that goes along with that is really a rate, uh, the OSHA injury rate is a way of comparing yourself to, uh, similar, well, ultimately it, it normalizes the number of injuries you have by the number of work hours that you work versus a, a typical company of 100 employees. And, you know, using that information is certainly helpful. It's a barometer, but it's really a lagging indicator, right? You have to wait for people to get injured in order to know whether you have injury rates or you're, you know, you've seen what happened yesterday. Same with the near misses, near hits. Now, what we do with that information and how we can use that information is hopefully a positive to go forward by doing that root cause corrective action, implementing those corrective actions, and on near misses, near hits, putting in preventive actions. Uh, and then you got some of the leading indicators, and several of you talked about some varieties of these types of things on this list of there, but whether it's safe acts observed was one of them. Um, you know, how you look at people, if you can look at behavior-based safety and what people are doing, uh, you have a way of, of looking at things. Now, I just give you an example. I was doing a job hazardous analysis um, as part of a training with, with the company I was working with. And we observed, we spent 30 minutes going through the job hazardous analysis of one area of, a, of one piece of equipment, of one station on that piece of equipment. And because they do some job rotation, we happened to see three different employees come over and do that job in the 30 minutes that we were there. All three of them, we found, did the job differently. And they were all trained, they were all qualified, no one was a new employee, but all three of them did it differently. And all three of them, in a sense, did things well. And at least one of them came over and had uh, a wrist strap, an ESD wrist strap that they had that they didn't plug into the right spot right away. And so it's the first time I ever saw, and I've been to that factory multiple times, the first time I ever saw an employee come over and they were working on a line with this wrist strap dangling from their hand on a moving line. And you know, something that the supervisors had never seen who I was working with. And so you, you look at those things, you said, oh, we saw a lot of safe acts, so a lot of people doing the right thing. And by one, mo one moment, in a sense, it all gets ruined in, in this, you know, as an opportunity for improvement. And so using those safe acts observed or unsafe acts observed is just another example of being active in how you look at things and what you can find. Um, so integrate your safety into your gamble walks, integrate your safety into your, your other products. Uh, so these are just some examples of some metrics. And uh, again, if anyone still uh, wants to chat some more that you've got, uh, please let us know because I'd, I'd love to see it at the end. 
So coming back towards the, our closure points, um, I brought back the same slide again, thinking back to the slide we had earlier of, you know, is safety is safety is a journey. You know, safety is about eliminating waste in our process, not just lean. You know, so you can say both of them ultimately are these things, um, is what I would argue as we go through it. And again, you know, they're they're go together, or you can apply some of the same principles to them. Uh, Closing up with some takeaways. Uh, ultimately, how do you integrate safety into your operational support processes? Make safety part of the practices. Uh, the goal isn't to create separate safety thoughts and have a safety team that only focuses on safety. Yes, you may have safety managers, safety committees, uh, people focused on safety is specifically, you do wanna have those things. I think they're good, uh, but ultimately having as much of the safety built into the way you do your business, the better off you are. Um, so everybody should have a role and responsibility in safety. All employees, it should be accountable for certainly the managers, the supervisors, but really for all employees should be held accountable for safety. And I'm not saying fire that person, fire that person, fire that person, because they do something wrong. Um, we want to create that culture where everybody is working together and looking out for each other. Uh, so we want that culture of safety where people are thinking about how can we make it safer? How can I make it safer for myself? How can we make it safer for the people who I'm working next to? Uh, and ultimately with that, you know, you, we work on involving the employees in that safety, looking at the metrics. I, I per really believe that better safety ultimately saves you money. Um, it is a very hard thing to measure because when you think about uh, you know, cost of quality is, a, is something we use in a quality world. You can measure certain things in quality, and sometimes you can say it's hard to measure. Well, cost of safety in the same way is very hard because what do you wait for? Well, we can wait for a workers' comp to come down, but you know what? That's a really lagging indicator because it takes a couple of years for your workers' comp to come down. You can have less injuries, but you know, you may not even have less injuries when you make these improvements. Uh, so it's a hard thing to measure because it's not all about injuries, it's not all about the workers' comp costs and the dollars and cents in the end, but that employee satisfaction, that feeling of being happy to work in an environment that they're working in, it's a huge effect. Um, you know, every company I work for has struggles to get employees, get enough employees, uh, certainly in the manufacturing world, but really any industry uh, up until you know, recent COVID stuff, uh, you know, employee, unemployment rate's been low, in the US and in foreign countries as well, getting employees that want to be in manufacturing and the operations world is very hard. And we want to create an environment where they're happy to work there. And uh, you know, some of our factories are, especially this time of year, hot. And guess what? People are now wearing a, ma a face mask while working. Um, so you have to worry about heat you know, issues even more so. Um, so we want our employees to feel satisfied and not feel upset and, and scared, really, to be in the workplace. We want them to be alert and aware of the hazards, but we want them to work effectively and efficiently um, with that, and hopefully that helps improve their satisfaction. Um, in the end, you know, creating, I call that really a developing trust. Uh, you know, our employees and our, the employees' families are trusting us every day that we have created a workplace that is safe and a good place to work. And if we want employees to help us make improvements, and this is really employees at all levels, if we want people to make imp help us make improvements, um, they have to have some trust that as a management team, the management's doing things right, uh, because you know, we want our employees to go home safe every day, whether it's to their spouses, kids, dogs, uh, you know, recreation events, uh, sporting events. Um, you know, we want people to go home safe, you know, the same way they came in. And employees ultimately are trusting us on a daily basis to create that environment. Um, and at the same time, you know, the management team and the lean practitioners and you know, quality and people, we're asking our employees to help us make it better. Help us change your jobs. Help us change the way things or business is done to make it better. And so we want employees to have that trust. And it's a two-way street. Uh, so can we be lean and safe? And I'll ask the question, can you afford not to? Um, I, I think they, you know, we have to be both lean and safe uh, to be a good, effective business. 
So with that, um, we'll turn it over right on time, I guess. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left to, for questions, if anyone has questions. Uh, so yes, you... thank you, Howard. Great presentation. I will start with one of the first ones that came through earlier. Um, I think you spoke to some components around change management and safety. And this question is, what would be the first step to do in order to break the resistance to change? Well, um, I don't think I have the magic elixir for that. Uh, but I mean, I did the previous slide. I, I talked about trust. Um, you know, I think there, there, it goes a long way. There's communication. Uh, you know, we have to, you have to develop that trust with employees. And, and you know, I, I go back to one of my early slides where I said, you know, the people said you only care about quality in slow season. You only care about output in busy season. It took three years really to convince people that we meant it. And you know, we had to be consistent in our application. We had to be consistent in things. Um, I think there's a personal involvement that goes along with this too. You know, there's there's people. The, everybody's a person. And you know, I, I go back to uh, you know this slide here, right? We we want employees to know that we want them to go home safe on a daily basis. Um, so uh, you know, it's a people it's a people factor. So you have to have the systems. You have to create systems to deal with change management, but you have to have people trusting you that you're going to work with them, and um, and that's not easy to do especially if you're going from a place of non-trust. Takes time and patience. Yep. Second question, um, can an organization integrate lean with other best standard practice techniques, i.e. Six Sigma, just in time, quality circles, circles, to achieve optimum results on a continual aspect? Um, and if so, I, how can they do this irregardless of the size? Irregardless of the size, size you said? Size of the organization. Size mm -hmm. of the organization. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, when I look at the lean thought process, um, I drive my wife crazy. Uh, the pick on her. Or my, actually, my I'm an engi I'm an engineer by training. I've got two sons who are now uh, young engineers. One just graduated with his degree. Um, so my wife gets to think that you know she's three against one a lot of times in our thoughts about efficiency and effectiveness. And you know, for us, it's just a natural factor on things. Um, and so I, I look at the same thing: is that yes, I mean, absolutely integrate safety into every aspect of your thought process integrate safety and the lean into uh all aspects you know safety is just it's it can't be an afterthought um it's got to be for in the forefront of our minds because all it takes to be unsafe um i use an example i'll, I'll ask everyone to do it themselves now think about how you if you cut a bagel i i like bagels so when I cut a bagel, I'm going to try and get in the right front of the camera. You know, the question is, are you cutting a bagel like this? Or are you cutting a bagel like this? Or are you cutting a bagel like, you know, whatever? Um, you know, it, integrate the safety into every thought of your process. You know, if you're cutting a bagel like this, you're cutting it towards your hand. And as uh, my father, when I corrected him on doing that, uh, you know, a while ago, he said, well, I've been doing it forever that way. And I've never gotten hurt. Um, <laughs> And so I said, yes, dad, but it's only one time and I see you in the ER, um, right? So uh, I think you got to, yes, I mean, it's, the, I think that the top organizations are integrating safety into every aspect of what they're doing because you can't separate it. it I look at it as an opportunity. When you get a new piece of equipment, I think companies are missing the opportunity. I, I talked about a new equipment safety review. Uh, I think companies are missing the opportunity to think about safety up front when they buy new pieces of equipment. They too often think about it, oh, we'll just worry about it after, we'll train people after we get it installed. Not mm. what are the things that we have as an opportunity to make things better. So yes, That's incorporate great. it all together. And how can we be proactive about those thoughts, right? How can we understand, um, begin to understand if that equipment has some potential risks and what we can put in place to mitigate those or at least prevent those. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, next question. What do you expect to happen in safety when the companies in the future would rely more on automation? Hmm. The idea of automation and safety. 
Well, um, I mean, certainly, you know, you see it all over the place, uh, robots replacing humans, um, lifting mechanisms. And, uh, you know, it's an example of, I mean, you, you, we still have humans involved. Uh, there's still a human being that has to go in and fix the robot, by the way, uh, which means mm -hmm. you still need to do lockout tag out. Uh, you still need to do you know, maintenance. So you're going to do maintenance on that robot. And so uh, lockout tag out becomes a huge factor for the maintenance person or employees around it. Um, you might have light curtains and things like that involved. And so um, yeah, I look at some of these robots, for instance, um, can do things that, you know, if you have employees, for instance, that are lifting boxes up all day like this, it's a perfect job for a robot to do instead of a human being because if you just, I'll, I'll ask everyone to do it themselves. Raise your arms up like this at the, you know, I'm doing it with showing it, whatever, but raise your arms up and feel the strain, you know, with your arms like this or, or do your job lower. Feel the strain on your own arms or shoulders, especially if you got some rotator cuff problems like I have. Um, so robotics are opportunities to do things safe, you know, like painting operations. Uh, you know, it, they're perfect for things where you have employee interactions which can be made safer. Um, so a lot of times we, we can really focus on not just what the productivity improvement is from a robot, but what is the safety improvement that we get from that same robot. But don't forget the lockout tag out and the maintenance uh, factors when you're doing it. Maybe Howard, when you speak to lockout tag out, I don't know if anybody, if everybody understands what you mean with that phrase. Sure. Sure. Uh, lockout tag out means before you work on a piece of equipment, let's just take if you were on a, uh, a press that does this all day um, and stamps metal before you put your hand in the middle of that stamp that's coming down with 100 tons or whatever of pressure. If your hands in there, your hand gets crushed just like the metal gets crushed um, or gets stamped out. And so before you do that, you want to release the energy and control the energy. And so controlling the energy is often means uh, turning off the electric to it, uh, might be releasing the stored energy that's in there. So if you have a, a piece like that does this all day, you either want to lower it down so it's closed or you need to put blocks in it so it can't close anymore. Um, releasing hydraulic pressure. So you do those things and you evaluate your equipment and you put a lock on it so that no one can turn it back on um, and you, before the employee then goes and works on it. So it's a critical factor for um, uh, equipment safety and employee safety. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, looks like we have time maybe for one more. What is your recommendation when you have a customer who is requiring work to be done in a defined time and that defined time or you know getting that that work out quickly is more relevant than safety so you have a focus on outcome over safety um you know that that focus on outcome over safety is really a management failure uh so you know, that's that's management making decisions to put safety second. Um, and I, I grant you, I've, I've worked in manufacturing for 30 years. I, I get it. I see it. I understand the importance of satisfying the customer. Uh, the question becomes always, how do you have systems and people that actually resist that change and resist that temptation? Um, taking those shortcuts is a very easy thing to do and you know something as simple in your house i talk you know, i do safety training one of the examples i use is if you have to change a light bulb in your house do you go and get a, a step ladder or do you take the chair that's nearby you and stand on it um and uh if i could see the audience you know normally more than 50 percent and more than 75 percent people say yes i take the chair and stand on it. Then I'll, I'll ask you the next question. How many of those chairs had moving wheels? And I guarantee you that there's a you know, percentage of people that stood on that chair. Why? Because it, the step ladder was you know, 20 feet away. Um, so these are mentalities and, and it's easy to fall into the, well, we have to do it this time. Um, you, know, you have to trust yourself and create that environment where it's not the norm. Uh, and there's, it's not an easy answer because I, I get it. You have customer pressures. Everybody has a pressure to do it. And you can answer the same thing for quality, by the way. 
Uh, if you substitute the word safety and quality there, I guarantee you that same thing happens, the same opportunities are happening on a daily basis. All right, thank you. Um, there were a couple more questions, but what I will do is I will provide those to Howard and he can answer those individually um, via email. And I really appreciate your time, Howard. Another reminder, great presentation. Lots of comments came back saying they enjoyed the, the webinar and it was a lot of really good information, so thank you. Reminder right. again, back we're back in July, July 8th at noon central time to hear a presentation on lean and RPA. So thank you again for your time and you will be getting RU credits sent to you automatically within 24 hours. Take care, everybody. Have a safe rest of your month. Bye-bye. Thank you. So Frank, you're still there? Yeah, but I've got this uh, repetitive motion injury now I gotta deal I, with. I see that now. I see your, thank you for your comment. I guess we're still on air showing the screen. A lot of great points, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Ellen did a great job too. Everything Has Ellen, on. Ellen still, Ellen gone, I guess? I'll stop here on my webcam.